Okay, good morning, everybody. We get our cue, we are live. So uh, very welcome to the uh, Renew for Equality webinar. Uh, it's a very exciting webinar because we have the honor to uh, welcome today Commissioner Helena Dali, who yesterday presented the uh, uh, LGBTI uh, rights strategy for the European Union. And I think we are the first group to, to welcome her. So it's really a very special occasion. Uh, we have a very rich program. So uh, I'm going to, uh, to limit my introduction to just a few minutes, but uh, there are a couple of things I want to say. First of all, uh, as I said, it's a very happy occasion that after so many years where the European Parliament was calling for a strategy specifically for LGBTI rights, that finally we have something on the table. So that is excellent news. But yesterday we have more excellent news. I don't know if you noticed this, but the Constitutional Court of Latvia uh, ruled that the state has a duty to ensure the rights of LGBTI people. And that was, of course, that was great news. But I think it was also a reminder that it is not enough to have LGBTI rights uh, enshrined in the constitution and in laws and on paper, but that we also need independent courts to ensure that those rights are being applied in practice. And therefore, uh, today I'm going to not just welcome the LGBTI strategy by Commissioner Daly, but also appeal to Commission President von der Leyen to ensure that the courts in all countries are independent. Uh, and that means that we also expect action from the European Commission in the case of Poland and Hungary, where LGBTI rights are under pressure. Uh, I, I did not want to let this occasion pass to, um, to, to issue that statement as well. Um, I think the LGBTI rights are very important, um, not just for LGBTI people, but also for our Renew group. Why? Because it is part of a set of values. It's, it's not an isolated issue. It has everything to do with the way we see the world, with our worldview. Um, you could, you, if you see the, the populist parties, they take women's rights and LGBTI rights as the, the core of their program, if you want, uh, what they call the natural order. And I think that's why it's so important that we show that in our natural order, people are equant, equal, different, but equal. We want a society where people have equal rights. We want a society that's very rich in its diversity, but also a society where everybody feels safe, where everybody can uh, uh, grow to their full potential. Uh, that is our worldview, and that is why it's so important to, uh, to underline this. We have, uh, earlier this year, we have issued our 10 points action plan um, that we want to put into practice. Uh, and I have to say, I'm very proud to be a member of this group. Uh, and in particular, the Renew for Equality section with very active members from all over Europe. Uh, that's a real joy, I have to say. Um, and therefore, I'm not going to, to speak for much longer, but I'm going to, uh, to introduce the, the program and the other speakers. Um, we, uh, we start with uh, a section with specific focus on specific issues, and each of those will be introduced by one of my Renew colleagues. Uh, but for two minutes, and then uh, we have uh, an, an expert speaking for about five minutes. So we have five different introductions, and then we open the floor for debate. Um, and then um, at uh, 10 past 11 around, we expect to be joined by Commissioner Dali, who is going to give us uh, a keynote speech. So um, very, very good program for this morning. Um, and I'm going to uh, to announce the first topic, and that is uh, fight uh, LGBTIQ phobia across the EU, and it will be introduced for two minutes by my colleague uh, Nico Stefanuta. Um, and then there will be a five minute presentation by Miko Czerwinski, uh, who is a, a Polish activist from the Rofnocz uh, Foundation. Uh, Nico, you have the floor for two minutes. Good morning. Good morning, Sophie. It is an honor to be a member of uh, Renew for Equality. I'm a member of the European Parliament representing Romania, and I was officially the first uh, member of the European Parliament from Romania to attend a Pride. This is perhaps 
silly for many of you, but it is important in Romania, a country that has not been so used to the topic, but a country that, however, starts to understand better the topic. And I'm here to talk about LGBTIQ phobia across the EU, more specifically to introduce Miko, who will be the real expert. And I will say the following three comments. In the com that was released yesterday, I read the commission's emphasis on providing safety and freedom for LGBTIQ people. And for me, it is a bit shocking, you know, because every single citizen should have safety and freedom on this continent. And we are not there yet. And it is a, a rude awakening when you read this document because you almost feel like it comes from another time. And it's good that the commission has come with these proposals because we cannot allow a parallel time to happen under our eyes in the 21st century. I also love the way Ursula von der Leyen portrayed it and, uh, and uh, Commissioner Dali as this is not an ideology, this is my identity. Because many of the times whenever we speak about this at home, people talk about agendas and ideologies and so on. And we need to drive the point home that this is an identity. This is about the integrity. This is about mention view that it's, it's your dignity as a person. Now, some things are better across the EU, some are worse. We saw the number of 43% of people who feel discriminated compared to 37 in 2012. That is a number that has gone worse. We see discrimination, we see phobia in what regards uh, society, but also employment, but also the readiness of people to accept uh, difference. Uh, in one EU, um, EU uh, uh, survey, we saw a lot of numbers that said that people would be still uncomfortable knowing a friend of the family, an employee, or somebody they're dating is, is uh, I mean, somebody, their, their daughter, for instance, is dating is, is LGBTIQ. So uh, we saw, obviously, very, very severe cases in Poland, and I'm sure that Miko will speak with great authority uh, about that, but let's not isolate it. This happens in a lot of countries, including my own. Um, I'm very happy, for instance, that uh, uh, the, the case that Sophie mentioned in the court, I would like to see that happening also in Romania as regards the Coman ruling. Um, Adrian Coman has been a, a leader on which concerns the recognition of, of uh, civil uh, partnerships and uh, the status of, of uh, marriage that he enjoys outside the country, but not inside. And I like very much uh, another quote from the from the uh, communication. Nico, Nico, can I, I... I'm passing the time? Okay, yes. then I'll switch, switch to the real expert, Miko Czerwinski. Uh, he represents the Rovnosc uh, Foundation in, in Poland, and I'm very, very eager to hear what the news there is. Thank you, Sophie. Thanks, Miko, for being here. Yes, thank you. And sorry for interrupting you, but we can only do this program if everybody's of really course. going to stick of to course. the time. And I, I don't want to interrupt the whole time because I want to listen to you. Miko, very you have sad. the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, as Nico said, um, I'll be primarily speaking about Poland, obviously, but uh, I think it's it's worth knowing that the issue is uh, similar and the issue is happening across the whole Europe. And I see only Poland as a warning sign to other countries in Europe that what can happen if there is no actual LGBTI equality um, provided by the European Union. Uh, first, we, we speak about LGBTQI phobia and we have to look at the hate speech and hate crime situation. We, um, I'm very happy to see that in the strategy uh, there is the call that hate, hate speech and hate crime will be harmonized across European Union because in Poland we have no such legislation and it leads to both government officials and um, public television demonizing or further um, incite, inciting to hatred um, people in Poland. And this caused a lot of hate crimes happening in pretty much someone being beaten or someone being attacked for who they are. 
Uh, and uh, we recently run a survey in the city of Krakow um, regarding that topic. And we saw that in the city of Krakow, one of the most multicultural open cities in Poland, the number of um, people, LGBTI people experiencing discrimination is still at 62%. Um, what's more worrying even is that uh, many of those um, people said that the police was not reacting in a manner um, helping them or wanting to react to the hate crimes they um, they experienced. Very often police ignored the, the calls or simply um, made the statement that, oh, at least you're alive, so you shouldn't um, be worried. And this is a very, uh, very um, hard situation for LGBTI people because their experiences of violence are not being treated um, fairly. Another part of the situation in Poland that probably most of you know is other LGBTI free zones, um, as uh, they're called. Uh, this happens in, um, you know, nearly one third of Poland is in some sort of zones that are exclusionary to, uh, as Sophie said at the very beginning, non-natural or the non-traditional values. But what that really means, it, it excludes both LGBTI people, but also single parents. It excludes uh, various other forms of families. And people are scared in those places. We heard of um, 400 uh, complaints to the European Commission regarding the situation in Poland, and most of them were connected to LGBTI free zones. Um, I've personally spoken with um, a farmer living in one of the zones that is scared first and foremost for his life and his partner's life. He's scared to um, live there. He's considering moving uh, out of Poland because he can no longer feel safe uh, doing his business. Uh, doing agriculture as he used to. He was also so scared that he didn't want to even send a complaint to ombudsperson or to European Commission because he was afraid of being outed and also afraid of then repercussions from the government, for example, denying EU funds. What more can be said is that this LGBTQA phobia in those zones represents itself in, for example, access to services. And our foundation, for example, was denied access to the cultural center to show a film, to do a film screening about LGBTI issues um, in that cultural center, uh, simply because it was called an ideology, as Sophie said. We, and um, there was a great question that it's not an ideology, it's, um, it's persons that are being, um, being denied justice. And just as a final statement here, um, I, I can see that there are more and more uh, discriminatory um, acts and bills being introduced, being provided, for example, the recent Stop LGBT bill that will ban equality marches across Poland. And we are afraid of what's going on and we need European Commission to act uh, quickly and act strongly on those issues. And again, with funding, on the issues, we need the funding to be accessible, not only available, because so far the EU funding uh, had a 20% marking on own contribution, and that is not accessible to many LGBTI NGOs in, for example, LGBT free zones. Um, thank you very much. I'll stop. Okay, thank you then. Um, the next item will be freedom of movement for all rainbow families uh, and it will be introduced by my colleague uh, Radka Maksova, uh, followed by a presentation by uh, Adela Horakova, who's a, a lawyer and a driving force behind the Czech marriage equality uh, campaign. And uh, I think they're already going to provide some answers to one of the questions uh, that came in in the the Q and A uh, that says, uh, hang on, let me let me get this. Uh, the question is, uh, it's from Christina. It says the lack of same sex marriage rights or at least civil partnership in many EU countries is one of the biggest forms of discrimination against LGBTQIA couples. There is no logical, fair reason why a 21st century secular country would not give everyone equal marriage rights. 
How does the Commission and the Parliament plan to tackle that problem, especially in countries such as Romania or Poland or the Czech Republic, uh, for example? It was actually addressed to, to Nico, but I think uh, in this round it can also be addressed. Radka, you have the floor. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, dear colleagues, dear Sophie, first of all, uh, let me thank Sophie for organizing this webinar and thank you all for meeting with us today to discuss the new LGBTI strategy. This is a truly historic movement uh, for LGBTI uh, uh, rights in Europe. However, it is still a long way to go to LGBT community to experience true equality and life free from, from discrimination. The strategy points to key issue uh, that the LGBT community is experiencing and opens door to future legislative proposals. I expect us to work as closely together with the uh, Commissioner Dali so that we are able to ensure equality LB, uh, LGBT IQ people, especially in Poland and Hungary, where the situation continues to worsen. One of the key issues that the strategy is dealing with is the legal protection of rainbow family in cross-border situation. As uh, Vice President Jourova and the Commissioner already mentioned at the press conference, when the someone is a parent in one country, they have to be parents everywhere in Europe. This is not about changing national legislative. This is about respecting legal family bonds from one country in all member states. Without it, we do not have a real freedom of movement. To tell you more about real life situation and legal issues with cross-border situation of rainbow families, I am honored uh, that my dear friends Adela Horákova from the Czech Republic is here to join us. She is uh, as uh, Sophie said, a uh, key lawyer from the Prague Pride and Equal Marriage Movement in the Czech Republic. And she is joining us to talk about uh, family law, the importance of making legislation equal and the relation between family law and the right to free movement. Thank you. The floor is yours, Adela. You have to unmute. Yeah, I am unmuted now. Um, so uh, thank you, Mrs. Maxova. Uh, it's very good to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, first of all, I want to um, extend my thanks to everyone on this call uh, for helping to make the strategy happen. I'm sure it was a, a long and sometimes perhaps not an easy process. So Renew Europe, all the other MEPs in the LGBTI intergroup, uh, the commission, everyone who worked on it. Um, I'm very excited for the strategy to be out, and I agree with everyone that this is a historic moment. Um, um, it is a step towards a Europe which is more free, cohesive, and connected. Um, Europe is a very special place, and the European citizenship brings uh, with itself a very special set of rights and freedoms that are perhaps unprecedented compared to the rest of the world. Um, the uh, right to equal treatment and non-discrimination, the right to respect family and private life, um, the right of free movement. So it is only a shame that actually in some of these rights and freedoms, we shoot ourselves in the foot by not allowing some of our European citizens, the LGBTIQ community, to fully exercise and fully enjoy these rights and freedoms. Um, because when they want to move around and they're considering um, whether they want to move to the host member state, it's not always just about a job. It's not about how much they will be paid and what kind of job they will get there. The recognition and safety of their partnerships and their families is a key decisive factor in exercising that freedom of movement. So if we put barriers to that freedom, we are not allowing and we're restricting LGBTIQ people from moving around freely. Um, it is simply not acceptable to board a plane in Amsterdam as a family and then get out at the airport of Prague not being a family. It's a bizarre situation. So I think we need to recognize that there is something that plays a vital part in the decision-making process of freedom of movement of LGBTIQ people. Um, and actually it does not impact only individuals uh, as we have seen in the case of the European Medicines Agency um, the restrictions on the freedom of movement can have a real impact on functioning of European institutions and its agencies. Um, 
In the Czech Republic, we have seen two years ago, we have seen a judgment from the Supreme Administrative Court refusing to acknowledge a um, marriage between two men concluded under Dutch law, Czech and a Dutch citizen. Uh, the court cited two reasons. One, that there is no equal marriage or same-sex marriage in the Czech Republic. The second one being the public order or the public policy. Um, I suspect that the public order and the public policy is a reservation that is used as a sort of a backdoor escape for many refusals of equal treatment. And the new legislation that is going to be put forward by the commission or the revised framework of, of guidelines should, I think, make sure that um, this backdoor cannot be used in the future to kind of bypass um, the legislation. Now, in addition to this specific case law that I just mentioned and that is still in place, and that came out actually five days before the Coman case, um, there, is a, uh, there is another example showing you how important it is that we have a European framework. When the pandemic started in spring, the Czech government quickly closed off the borders and started to issue regulation with exceptions who can come in and out of the country. In the first versions of the regulation, only husbands, spouses, and children were allowed to come into the country, thereby excluding same-sex couples, even same-sex couples, same-sex partnerships concluded under Czech law, but obviously also same-sex couples from other from cross-border couples, either married or registered partners, and also excluded children who are not recognized as children of the same-sex partners in the Czech Republic. Um, so this was a this is still the case. The, the, the regulation has been amended, but even when this sort of pandemic-specific regulation goes away and we go back to the business as usual legislation, there's still, um, as I said, uh, problems with recognizing cross-border marriages and partnerships and parenthood in the Czech Republic. So I'm looking forward to the, and I, and I welcome very much the, the plan of the commission expressed in the strategy to revise the guidelines on the freedom of movement directive and to explore the possibilities for the cross-border parenthood and partnership recognition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Adela. And uh, I would just like to, before I give the floor to uh, for the, for the next uh, item, I would just like to underline that you are actually the living proof, uh, uh, Radka, Nico, uh, Adela, Miko, of the fact that this is not an East-West issue. I always very much resist that image. Uh, and if you, I mean, it's it's a funny kind of consolation. But just last week in the Netherlands, uh, there was a big, huge row. Uh, because one of the government parties that is really a, a kind of fundamentalist light uh, Christian party uh, four months before the election said, well, you know, uh, religious schools should have the right uh, to ask parents to demand that parents sign a declaration that they are opposed to, um, uh, uh, to uh, LGBTI people. Uh, but still they should make sure that children are safe in schools. And you go, how, how can they be safe in schools if they have to be, uh, you know, if it's almost mandatory for them to be uh, in the closet? I mean, it's the ultimate unsafe. So homophobia knows no borders, but fortunately uh, the fight for LGBTI rights and a completely different vision of what society should be also doesn't know any borders. So with that, we're going to the next uh, point that will be introduced by uh, Pierre Karlskind um, uh, from the Renew Group, uh, and the presentation will by, be by Benoit Bert, uh, who is a, uh, a French citizen and founder of the collective uh, Rien à Guérir, uh, Nothing to Cure. So, Pierre, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Good morning to everyone. And I'm really pleased to be with you this morning. I'm uh, really pleased and thank you to all the participants. Nothing. Uh, to cure, there is a, an American proverb saying that if it, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. That could be the, 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 the title of my intervention and what Benoit is going to, to tell us. Uh, I'm going to switch it in French to continue my, uh, my, my intervention. En, en quelques mots, je voudrais, in uh, a nutshell, je I would like Alors, to... Juste que... Let me just check whether or not it works. C'est bon very well. As I was saying, 
on the conversion therapy, the European Parliament already adopted two resolutions in 2016 and 2017 uh, uh, asking to forbid these therapies in Germany and Malta and two regions in Spain wrote in their laws this prohibition. There are other projects in France and in the Netherlands. I recently talked to the French minister who is following up on this issue and we need, we can already be happy with the fact that this topic is tackled uh, within the strategy of the European Commission. This being said, it's a pity that she doesn't go further. She only mentions conversion therapies, talks about good practices. Good practices are good, but we need good practices. And I'm not sure all countries have good practices on this. As a consequence, I think we will need to continue working on this. And that's what the European Parliament will have to do. We will need to keep putting pressure on this. And I am quite happy to see Benoit Bert is about to take the floor here. He uh, lived, uh, went through such a therapy between 15 and 18 years old. He was a minor, underaged, and as a consequence, we cannot talk about freedom. Some people say uh, everyone is free, but when you are between 15 and 18, you are underaged and you are not free. And as a consequence, uh, exchanging good practices is not enough. It is important to reinforce the position of the EP, but I won't dig into details and I will give the floor to Benoit. Thanks to all of you. Thank you so much, Pierre. Dear members of the European Parliament, Madame the Commissioner, I was born 31 years ago in a loving and caring Catholic family with parents who worked hard to give me the best childhood and education who truly wanted me well. At 15, when I told them that I was attracted to men, they asked for advice to their religious surroundings and decided to send me in a few psycho-spiritual retreats called Healing Deep Wounds. Those sessions were supposed to cure me from my homosexuality. Those three years were the darkest and most difficult experience of my young life so far. And to be fully honest with you, if I would not have found a way to escape them and to rebuild myself, I do not think I would be here today talking to you. So those, the method they used were a weird mix of approximative psychology and spirituality. They created unfounded fears of the futures in me by suggesting degrading images, behaviors, violating my own intimacy, and making me feel guilty of the love feelings I was having. Some of my friends endure much harder methods, such as the aversion therapy, forcing them to watch pornographic content to provocate a disgust reaction, exorcism to chase what they thought was the demon of homosexuality, electroshocks, or even rape and mutilation. Those methods only succeed to create shame, guilt, isolation, and despair. To rebuild myself from this painful experience, I had to overcome many challenges. I had to study what really is my homosexuality. I had to meet LGBTQ people and to understand what really are their realities. I had to get rid of my internal homophobia that those therapies inputted in, in me. I had to accept my own identity as diverse and complex as it is. But also I had to clarify my own relations, relation with my faith and understand that faith had nothing to do with those sectarian aberration. If God exists in this universe, I am sure that he would love me unconditionally. Finally, I had to forgive my parents and understand they only acted out of love and truly thought that they were doing the best for me. I had to be patient with them and to give a testimony of my own happiness hoping my family would accept my happiness and accept the way I am. And not only this te testimony helped them to accept me, but it proved them they did a mistake by trying to change me. It educated them on what homosexuality really is. Today, I am wondering, and I'm asking you the question, from the people who went through those conversion therapies, how many people succeed to overcome all those challenges? How many people had the chance I had? How many people are still locked and lost in those dangerous therapies? Three years ago, I've been approached by an investigator who encouraged me to testimony in a public documentary homotherapy and a book, Dieu et Amour. The documents were one of the first serious and solid investigation men in Europe on the subject. It showed me that not only those practices still exist, but this is a global phenomenon that is growing in Europe. I also gave a, a testimony in a parliamentary commission worked, working on a law propos proposal to ban conversion therapy in France the country of human rights. 
This parliamentary mission showed that those practices can take different forms and can come from different motivation, not only religious beliefs. We can regroup them in three big categories, the religious, the most commonly known, the medical ones, and the social conversion therapy. We cannot base any therapies, practices, and beliefs, and scientifically unproven methods. We cannot exclude the facts. A vast majority of people went through those practices, not only stayed in their own sexual orientation or gender identity and changed, but also got deeply hurt, traumatized, sometimes left so destroyed and hopeless that some of them ended their own life to end the pain the therapies made in them. How many self-called ex-gay who claimed they were cured from homosexuality finally confessed publicly they were never changed and were still having homosexual attraction? How many apologized for lying and perpetrating this method they also declare inefficient? How can, you, how can we ignore today the thousands of stories that the history told us? Let's be honest here. Those practices are not only inefficient and fraudulent, but also dangerous. Some of them are torture. The fact that today our European Charter of Fundamental Right is not enough to stop the growth of those barbarian acts means that we have a problem here. Like in France, we have a global, we have a legal loophole that you have to fix, a legal void that you can fix. Create a clear ban on those dangerous therapies will not only be a big symbol to say, no, it's not tolerated to torture LGBTQ plus people in our European Union, but also it is a very important tool to defend the victim and protect millions of potential ones. No, a ban is definitely not an attack against our medical or religious institution, but on the contrary, it is an important opportunity for them to get rid of those deflection that the geopolitics does them. Dear European Union, in 2008, 17, you voted a text encouraging countries to ban conversion therapies that inspired many countries to start their work, including mine. You can go further and properly continue the work you started by courageously voting for a clear ban. We are in 2020. We shouldn't be talking about this torture anymore. I have faith in our European institutions. So today, we and the million of people discovering themselves, we are counting on you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Benoit, for, for that testimony uh, and that call will not fall on deaf ears. Uh, we will work in the European Parliament for uh, a legislative initiative um, and then it's for the Commission to, uh, to make sure that the legislative proposal comes on the table. I know that uh, Pierre is extremely committed to, to these things and we'll fight together. Thank you. So uh, the next item is making the EU a welcoming place for LGBTIQ asylum seekers. It will be introduced by my nice colleague uh, Maite Pagasa Ortundua, uh, and then followed by a presentation by Katrin Hugendubel, uh, whom we all know from ILGA Europe. Maite, you have the floor for two minutes. Maite, you have to unmute. No. You have to unmute, Maite. No. Yes, yes, okay. fine, go ahead. So sorry. Oh, dear Sophie, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this event. It's clear it is necessary, so important. And thank you also to, to these touching testimonies and valuable contributions of the presentation of the EU strategy on LDTVAQ equality by the commission is uh, very good news. Yes, we said, Specifically, at this point, we will address the need to make the EU a welcoming place for LGBTIQ asylum seekers. Mm. This is a very relevant debate because there are many people persecuted because of their sexual orientation. And if they have to escape from their places of origin to reach a place with freedoms like Europe, 
it is especially necessary that they are treated as vulnerable groups. Oh, and in Europe, in the centers where the asylum claims will be analyzed, they may also suffer discrimination, stigmatization, or even very, very serious attacks. And they must be protected, is the first. We should also protect them so that there is a safe path for them to leave their countries and reach a safe place in Europe, the second. The problem is very specific and it is very necessary to use specific ways to be able to protect them. Safe path. To go deeper into this issue, we have Ms. Katrin Hudendubel, I suppose, Director of Promotion of ILGA Europe. And she will share with us her vision and contributions to make the EU a real welcoming place for LGBTIQ asylum seekers. Ms. Hudendubel. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this introduction. And thank you very much to Sophie and to the Renew Group to, to bringing this conversation together and to inviting us um, to join. Um, obviously, yesterday was, um, many said it before, an important day also for ILGA Europe. We've been working together with the Renew Group, with the LGBTI Intergroup, but also with member states and many also within the Council have called for this strategy. And we're very happy to see that it finally happened but also to see what a strong and clear document it is. Um, so as advocacy director of ILGA Europe, I coordinate ILGA Europe's advocacy work of which asylum is a very important part. Many of our over 600 member organizations in 54 countries across Europe and Central Asia are actually the first go-to point for LGBTI refugees. They often provide legal advice, they offer safe accommodations and shelters, as well as support community building and self-led advocacy. I think we all often have the idea, or we like to have the idea, um, the image in our head of the safe haven Europe for LGBTI refugees. What is more true, unfortunately, still today is the asylum lottery that we see happening in Europe on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's true that in many countries across the EU now, asylum on the grounds of sexual orientation and gender identity is recognized in legislation. Um, we have EU case law about adequate assessment of cases, so of not using stereotypes in assessing claims of um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans and intersex um, asylum claimants, but also, for example, of respecting late disclosure, so re uh, respecting this, the, the fact that many asylum um, claimants don't in their very first interview say for example, that they're gay because they come from a country where actually that puts them into extreme danger because they have been on a on a travel for years now where actually just saying that they're gay will expose them to extreme violence. Um, so we have the legal framework and the case law about all of that, but what it still depends on way too much is implementation. It is still chance if you have support for preparing your case, for example. It is still chance if you actually know about your rights to claim asylum on the grounds of sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex characteristics. So the claims for intersex um, asylum seekers, unfortunately, is still not recognized in most asylum legislation across Europe. And it's still chance if you meet an aware and well-trained interview uh, interviewer on the day of your asylum interview. And it's also still chance if actually the interpreter as well has the training and the awareness that's needed to properly put your case across. So it's really important that we see in this LGBTIQ strategy that the EC takes leadership in working with member states in addressing the needs of LGBTIQ applicants for international protection. Um, it's really important to see that they clearly do that regarding safe reception conditions. So including accommodation, what we think it also needs to include is actually access to healthcare 
for LGBTI refugees and asylum seekers and specifically um, really essential health care for trans and intersex asylum seekers. This is not a luxury. This is actually a life-saving access to health care for these people. It's only also really important to see that the EC is taking leadership to work with member states on the examinations of applications. As I said, the case law is clear, but the application is not. And I just want to give you some examples. Of course, states are entitled to investigate the, the validity of claims. But very often, these um, credibility questions are still based on harmful stereotypes based on Western tropes. So we have heard from our membership on examples, for example, where an Iraqi man um, had his asylum application rejected in Austria in 2018 on the grounds that he was faking being gay because his behavior was too girly. While an Afghan man was refused because neither your walk nor your behavior nor clothing indicate in any way that you might be homosexual. Credibility assessments still too frequently rely on these stereotypes. We've also, for example, heard that um, asylum seekers um, were questioned because they did identify as Muslim and people have been refused because it was deemed not credible that they could be lesbian because they had previously been married to a man. How can people from a vast array of social, cultural, religious and linguistic backgrounds be accepted expected to articulate their queerness with the terminology on conceptualizations of the West? How can people be expected to put forward their claims according to our views and imaginations of what their identity is like after they've gone through horrendous experiences in their own country, but also, as I said before, on the travel? So one thing we would add to the list for the commission, or actually two things, is on the one hand, we need to look closer at need to, um, to actually have access to country of origin information as well. Way too often, this information is looking at criminalization of homosexuality, so very classic cases, but the, the threats that LGBTI people um, face um, globally, but also within Europe, has become much more nuanced and especially on trans and intersex people, country of origin information is not adequate and often not updated. And of course, we also need to see LGBTI rights fully respected in the negotiations on the new asylum pact. So also so on the legislative side. Yeah, one more minute. Thank you very much. And that's where we'll be working with the Commission and the Parliament. What is key about the strategy, and I'm closing with this, sorry, um, in the area of asylum, but also for other areas, is that the European Commission finally assumes full responsibility again and commits to using all its tools at hand. Over the last year, it was often like seeing some feasibility self-censorship at work. We could do this, but some member states will not support it, so we will not do it. And with this document, the EC clearly states what needs to be done, on European and on national level, and that thus resets the frame of ambition and standards that we uphold in the European Union. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much and, and apologies, but I can see the clock ticking and uh, we want to have some time for debate before the commissioner comes. Uh, the last topic is, the, uh, is uh, the protection of rights of trans people all over the European Union. Uh, it will be uh, introduced by my energetic colleague Irene Tolleret, uh, and then there will be a presentation by uh, Richard Köhler, who's Senior Policy Officer uh, at Transgender Europe. Two minutes and five minutes, respectively. Irene, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Sophie. Dear colleague, I am so happy to be here with you today, as uh, today is the day after uh, yesterday, and yesterday was the first day of the first ever strategy LGBT IQ. So um, it's a good day. And it's a good day because we have also this uh, event. And uh, this event shows that uh, the commitment that Renew Europe has in the field of G LGBTIQ rights, our proactivity and our contribution to initiatives aimed at achieving equality for all. I am very happy today to introduce the discussion on the right of trans people. Trans and non-binary people and intersex people are too often forgotten in the legislation of the European member states. So trans identities have been depathologized in the 11th international classification of diseases in 2019. Seven countries in the EU still require 
sterilization for legal gender recognition. It's a shame. Uh, we, uh, while we have only six EU countries that do not require a mental health diagnosis and therefore allow uh, legal gender recognition based on self-determination. The situation for individuals uh, who identify outside of the gender binary is even more diffic difficult as only three member states have procedures in place to recognize non-binary genders. The new LGBTIQ strategy clearly supports the model of personal self-determination and promote an exchange of best practices between member states on how to put in place accessible legal gender recognition legislation and procedures based on the principle of self-determination. I strongly support this path to self-determination and I'm very glad to give the floor to Richard Keller, uh, who, as Sophia said, is Senior Policy Officer of that Transgender Europe, which is a human rights organization that is working towards the full equality for all trans people in Europe. Richard, the floor is yours, but before that, know that we support your cause. Thank you. And Thank you for these very warm words of welcome, uh, which also um, already introduce uh, me and Transgender Europe. I'm asked to speak about the situation of trans people in Europe today. Within five minutes, that's impossible, of course. Um, I can tell you it's a mixed bag. Uh, I fully support what Katrin just said in terms of um, the improvements we need to see for trans asylum seekers, both those are, that are coming and those who are already here and in the process, that's absolutely mandatory. Um, what we still see that safety and security is a huge concern for trans people. This has only been aggravated through COVID-19, where we see normative values around who is uh, worth saving, so to say, uh, actually lead to a debate which completely invisibilize trans people and everyone else, like who's more of a minority. Uh, sadly, when we had, uh, published our data around murdered trans people this year, we found seven reports of murdered trans people from the European Union. These are seven too many, just from the last 12 months. Um, the other issue that drives a lot of trans people is their recognition. Um, legal gender recognition has been uh, very dynamic for a number of years. Now we are very concerned that this has practically become uh, a standstill also in the European Union. We saw the UK government completely failing in uh, coming up with a reform of their very medicalized system. They gave in to very loud voices, um, uh, challenging the right to self-determination of trans people. Um, and that is very concerning because we still have uh, 25 member states in the European Union that are actually using uh, mental health uh, in their legal general recognition procedures. And there, uh, looking at the strategy, we are very happy that there is very clear and very strong language in there around legal general recognition, that this needs to be based on self-determination. Uh, and we also would see a very strong role for the European Union to help member states to actually use the momentum, to use the window of opportunity we have now and train uh, medical professionals to help, to help member states to reorganize trans-Pacific healthcare. Because let's not forget, this House, the European Parliament, you personally work very hard together with civil society for the World Health Organization to finally end that trans people are considered mentally ill. That happened, that is a major win and we should not forget that. We need to celebrate that, but we also need to make it a reality in member states. And for this, the European Union has limited competence, but it can still offer a lot when it comes to training, to awareness raising, to, um, to explaining to the member states how important it is. Um, you particularly asked me to talk about the situation uh, around backlash, and that is certainly a big concern. We see it, uh, all across the European Union. Uh, so for your words of it's not the East-West divide are so true. Uh, we see very strong voices in Sweden or in the UK claiming that women's rights are attacked when trans people are gaining more rights. It couldn't be farther from the truth. This is only there to split civil society and to split our humanity and we must stand united against that. But also we are under pressure from the other side, from very conservative groups, which are up to a completely new level uh, of coordination, of uh, infiltration of uh, religious groups, but also of governments. We're very concerned to see that. 
Um, the new mantra seems to be that uh, sex is the same as gender. Gender is not existent. It is called just a linguistic difficulty to be overcome. Um, and sex of a person cannot be changed. Romania just adopted a law which outlaws talking about gender identity in education. Imagine, like it's not even possible to speak anymore about it. The Bulgarian Constitutional Court said gender is not a concept that is uh, compliant with the Bulgarian constitution. And that was the ground why it rejected that Bulgaria could adopt the Istanbul Convention, such an important instrument to combat violence against women and gender-based violence. And you all know, and most of you have been involved with uh, trying to stop the banning of legal gender recognition in Hungary this summer. And now this week, the Hungarian parliament in a surprise move actually uh, suggested to again define sex in the constitution as something that cannot be changed as a biological uh, truth, um, which is, is, is uh, creating panic in the Hungarian trans community. And the Hungarian trans community told me that they are very much afraid that the strategy will not change anything for them in this regard. What they need is serious law enforcement. It is serious rule of law. And Sophie, you have been a very strong leader for an internal review mechanism on human rights within member states. And we need to keep on working on that field. Um, let me briefly, very briefly address just one thing with the strategy. We're very happy it's there. Um, we also agree with ILGA Europe. It is, is very strong. Um, also like that uh, trans uh, issues have been mainstreamed throughout. Um, it is great and we understand the limits of the strategy are also the limits of the competence of the EU. However, I would like to uh, point towards the linkage to the other strategies, such as the gender equality strategy when it comes to uh, combating gender-based violence. We see a very strong uh, component and need to connect those fields to uh, finally eradicate um, the bias, the ignorance, the hate and the violence against trans people. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, I would like to start by saying I'm extremely pleased and also very proud of all of you, uh, my colleagues and all the all the, the speakers. This has been an extremely rich uh, exchange of views. Uh, and I think uh, I can see my colleagues nodding uh, on the screen. We're all uh, even more fired up to fight uh, to get this strategy through, but not just that, but to also make sure that in that toolbox, we're also going to have some big bazookas because that's what we need. And when it comes to uh, responding to the, the last remark by Richard about the, the limitations uh, of EU competences, of course there are limits to EU competence, but it always strikes me how creative the Commission and the Council are when it comes to finding new legal basis, for example, for keeping out asylum seekers or for you know, financial uh, arrangements. Well, why don't they show the same creativity and courage when it comes to protecting human rights and the rights of EU citizens. Uh, and in many cases, they actually have the legal tools and they're just scared to use them. I started this, this seminar by, uh, by referring to the fact that the, the commission, and although you know, Mrs. von der Leyen made a wonderful statement uh, against the, the LGBTI free zones in Poland, then why is Mrs. von der Leyen still not going after uh, the Polish government and the way that they are just uh, completely destroying the independence of the judiciary, which is a, a key element in securing human rights. So, you know, Mrs. von der Leyen, uh, don't just uh, talk the talk, but walk the walk. Uh, and that is also, we'll be backing Commissioner Dali, whom, uh, who I know is extremely committed. Okay, so um, we, have, we have a bit less time than foreseen for questions and debate, um, because we overran our, our time a little bit, because Commissioner Dali is supposed to uh, to intervene uh, in 15 minutes. So um, uh, I'll try and, and kick off. I have to switch between screens here. Uh, we, we already received many, many, many uh, questions. I'm, I'm just going to try and, and summarize a few uh, uh, by way of kicking off the debate. Um, uh, I think there's some questions about how is the commission uh, actually going to to ensure that this strategy will be put in practice. We, we hope to hear that from the Commission uh, later on, uh, but also a question referring to um, right-wing governments that are scapegoating LGBTI people, but assuming that that is due to 
a lack of awareness. Um, I'm personally not convinced that it's lack of awareness. I think there are some really evil uh, spirits there, but we can debate that. Question to Maite, uh, there's a lot of cases where same-sex partners are not uh, recognized as a couple by the national migration offices. What are you going to do about that uh, in practice? Um, okay, so, uh, and then the last question maybe, there's uh, a huge turbulence, the question says, with legal recognition of LGBTIQ unions in Baltic countries. Uh, what could be done from the, the EU Commission, but also the EU, EU Parliament, of course. Okay, there are already some, some topics to kick off the debate. Um, please use the raise hand button or indicate in the chat that you want to speak. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody to really stick to one minute. Uh, I'd like to wind up about eight minutes after 11, so we can welcome the Commissioner. All right, who would like to kick off? Okay, don't be shy. Okay, Pierre. I'm gonna try not to be too shy. Um, no, moi je, je, bon, déjà, je veux remercier l'ensemble des interprétations. And I would like to thank juste... all the speakers. Uh, alors, attendez, mm. j'ai mon interprétation dans les oreilles. Oh, one sec. If I hear the interpreter at the same time I'm speaking, it will be tricky. Anyhow, I wanted to thank all the speakers and just stress one point, which is very dear to me and which is very dear to everyone, I think. And I'd like to bounce back on what Commissioner Daly has said yesterday. No uh, one U European euro would uh, go to European projects which are not respecting uh, human rights. And I intervened yesterday during the budget committee on uh, the mechanisms we adopted. And I wonder if these mechanisms will allow us to indeed avoid to see discriminatory projects to be funded. I think there is a major question mark pending there. And I think that we will need to tackle this issue. And if we need to amend the text, we need to bear this in mind. Thank you. Uh, maybe I can uh, steer the debate a bit and, and ask you to uh, elaborate a little bit on the proposal that you are working on uh, to actually screen the, the current expenditure and see uh, you know, to what degree that complies with our human rights standards. I think that would be interesting for the, for the audience if you wish. Can you say something about that, Pierre? You have to unmute yourself. You're on mute. Okay. Well, yes. We are working I'm working on an initiative report, or rather a draft initiative report, and that report before the uh, Commission initiative could ask some questions and shift towards a legislative initiative with a joint report uh, with the Kant and Libe committees. The wish would be to take stock of the potential projects that have been financed and that are contrary to our values. There are examples already. A church was renovated in Poland with poly a theater. It was a theater, sorry. It was re refurbished with European funds in Poland. The theater refused to accept LGBTI movie festivals and at the same time uh, was uh, welcoming fest movie festivals about uh, movies defending family values. So it is questionable. I would like us to examine all of that and so that we ask ourselves questions because we are always being told we are subjective. You you want to install your ideology. That's what they say. We need to find very precisely how we can fight that battle. Yes, thank you very much. I, I, I'm very happy that you uh, you explained that. It's, it's something uh, we all wholeheartedly support. I note that in the meantime, the commissioner has already joined us. Good morning, commissioner. A very welcome to you. Um, I have one more one more colleague who asked for the floor, but maybe well, I see it disappearing now. Maybe uh, I can suggest, if it's okay with uh, Irene Tolleret, that we go to the commissioner immediately 
so that maybe you, if you do your speech first, we'll have some, some time left for questions. Is that okay with you, Commissioner? Yes? Okay, excellent. Then I'm, uh, we, we've already had a, a, a several interventions uh, this morning uh, and we've all been very eagerly waiting for your uh, arrival because everybody is very happy and excited with the strategy that has been put on the table uh, yesterday for the first time. Uh, so we congratulate you on that. Uh, and I think there, there are many questions already in the in the Q&A about how the strategy is going to be uh, uh, applied in practice. How are we going to make sure that it will be that all the legislative proposals will be adopted and how, how some of the instruments can actually be turned into uh, legislation. So, in other words, how can we make sure that the toolkit will have some big bazookas in it? Uh, Commissioner, I'm going to uh, to give you the floor without uh, further ado. And again, thank you very much for uh, proposing the strategy. Thank you, Sophie, for organizing this. And But I want to correct you, whereas not everybody is happy with the strategy. So, um, but uh, it's our work and we will do it and we will persevere. And one day, these detractors will realize that we are on the right side and we will be on the right side of history. So I really, really thank you, uh, Renew Europe, for organizing this event and for consistently championing the union of equality that we are working to build. In our work, we refer to the core set of values of European integration in which equality and non-discrimination are central considerations. Indeed, the main principle of our union of equality approach is that there must be no second class citizens or residents, but a union where all are treated equally and are able to thrive, lead and be free. Over the years, the EU developed a solid set of laws and policies to support equal treatment and protect people against discrimination. Nonetheless, there is still a long way to go before we can say that we have tackled discrimination against LGBTIQ people. The results of a recent survey by the Fundamental Rights Agency show an, incredible, an increase in the reported levels of discrimination towards LGBTI people since the previous survey, which was, as you know, conducted in 2012. As many as four out of 10 respondents said they felt discriminated against in 2019 in all areas of the survey. So for LGBTIQ people, it can still be unsafe to simply be themselves, to be visible with a partner in public or be otherwise open about their sexuality or gender identity. This is not to mention LGBTIQ free zones and even legislative steps backwards, which we are now sadly all familiar with. Civil society organizations promoting LGBTIQ equality increasingly report opposition to their work. The current health crisis has amplified these inequalities for LGBTIQ people. For instance, healthcare discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity can deepen the risk of coronavirus. Confinement has forced many LGBTIQ younger and older persons into hostile environments where they are at risk of violence and increasing levels of anxiety or depression. Rainbow families face problems to have civil status documents legally recognized in cross-border situations, putting them in difficult situations during border closure. In these uncertain times, we need to pay full attention to the diversity of LGBTIQ people, in particular to the most vulnerable. This includes trans, non-binary, intersex, and queer people who are among the least accepted groups in society and are at even greater risk of discrimination and violence. The LGBTIQ equality strategy that was adopted yesterday, as you know, it's, it's the first of its kind for our union and intends to set a new benchmark 
for LGBTIQ equality progress. So the LGBTIQ uh, equality strategy will help to build a union where people in all their sexual and gender diversity are equal and where they can be themselves without fear of discrimination, exclusion or violence. We will propose new anti-discrimination legislation to strengthen equality bodies, as well as address any gaps identified in the application of the Employment Equality Directive. We will also continue to push for the adoption of anti-discrimination legislation beyond the area of employment. We address the situation of LGBTIQ asylum seekers who are at particular risk of discrimination and violence. The Commission will insist on appropriate protection of vulnerable applicants, including, of course, LGBTIQ people under the reform of the common European asylum system. Member states have varying levels of protection against hate crime and hate speech. And we miss EU level legislation to punish these crimes. In this regard, the Commission's new strategy proposes to extend the list of EU crimes to cover hate crime and hate speech, including, of course, when targeted at LGBTIQ people. We will also push for mutual recognition of parenthood in the EU. As President von der Leyen stressed in her recent State of the Union address, if you are a country, we will support the mutual recognition of gender spouses and partners in cross-border situations. And finally, the strategy strives to advance LGBTIQ equality beyond EU borders. But the Commission cannot advance LGBTI equality alone. We need close cooperation between EU institutions, member states and EU agencies. This is why we are calling on all member states to adopt equalities, LGBTIQ equality strategies of their own to address national and local concerns. It is crucial for us to engage with the private sector, social partners and civil society and listen to the LGBTIQ community. I heartily thank you, Renew Europe, once again for, for, for your commitment towards LGBTIQ equality and call on all political groups and MEPs to emulate this, to do the same. And let us fulfill the obligations of our treaty and ensure that LGBTIQ people to be free, to be who they are, live where they like and love who they want to love. I thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Commissioner, uh, and thank you again for uh, very energetically uh, driving this agenda. Uh, you've done the same in your country very successfully. So um, if, that is, if that's the standard, then uh, we're, we're looking forward to a successful uh, term. Uh, can, we, uh, can, we have, can we take a few questions? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Who would like to take the floor? Uh, Irene Tolere first. Yes, um, uh, thank you very much, Sophie. Thank you, uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, for what you are doing. So I have, first of all, a, a reaction and uh, to underline what you said, that not everybody is happy with uh, this uh, LGBTI uh, strategy. I will take an example. Uh, we had a fantastic uh, amendment that uh, went uh, through Renew that was uh, uh, not uh, uh, allowing LGBTI anti-gay uh, uh, zone to have a, a, a resilience facility uh, loan money, but this amendment fell, and this amendment fell not through ECR and ID rapporteurs. So uh, it's important that we realize that uh, the noise that the anti-LGBT are doing in some countries 
can uh, uh, drive uh, some uh, MEPs not to fight and put a free vote or uh, accept a, a, an, ab an abstention uh, where we want pluses to deliver on, uh, on binding uh, measures. So my question is, as this country exists, uh, wouldn't it be nice in some subjects that are linked to first member state competence and second unanimity uh, to try and work on, uh, on cities direct to create uh, LGBTI, uh, IQ, uh, safe sort of cities that would become uh, 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 examples to uh, make sure that in these specific countries, we still can talk about gender. Okay, thank you. I have a second question by Benoit Bert from uh, France, from the organization uh, Rien à Guérir. Uh, nothing to cure uh, who's been working on the issue of uh, conversion uh, therapies. Benoit. Thank you, Sophie. Yes, I, I would like to thank you very much and Wabi, um, thank you again for all the work that you have done. I think it's really important. I can see that in your strategy, um, protecting and promoting LGBTQIQ people, body and um, mentally health, you, you approach this issue and you specifically say that you encourage and, and you would like an exchange of good practice um, of the member states. I would like to ask you, how can you precise what does it really mean? And also, what are the real actions that you can do to really ban? I think the words are important here. And what you already did in 2017 inspired a lot of people. And if you really engage yourself on banning those torture, uh, I think it will create a real and important movement in Europe. Thank you. Okay, we'll have one last question. This is the opportunity, Catherine. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and thank you very much to Commissioner Dali. Of course, you, 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 know, you know how much we appreciate the, your, your strong leadership and, and commitment. Um, just two questions really. Um, what is so great about the strategy that it's really an encompassing work program for many different sections of the commissions with clear areas of social and employment policies on health and so I don't know if you could say a little bit on how you're going to work with your colleagues so Commissioner Kiriakidis, Commissioner Schmidt on actually turning all these ambition actions that are, that are quite new I would say to have them on paper like that into action and the other question is going into a little bit what we've said about not everybody's happy, but we also know that more are happy than it sometimes seems. There have been 19, I think by now actually 20 member states actively calling for an LGBTI strategy. And we know through exchanges we have that they're actually quite looking forward to that. So how are you in touch also with member states in the council who, who want to strongly welcome the strategy and are looking forward to actually do that together with you? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we'll go back to the commissioner. You're on mute. You have to unmute. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you uh, again. And, and uh, I, I thank you for your uh, support for, for the um, strategy um, with regards to the first question. Yes, we are already working with, with uh, cities. Of course, uh, this is a member state uh, competence, but I agree citizens, uh, cities have a, a very important role and I, and I intend to focus more on, on this aspect as far as, of course, uh, our competencies allow me to, to, to do so, uh, but cities are where, where the people live, where, where they are experiencing um, the freedom or the lack of freedom. It's, it's, it's where we live. And, and, and I think that, that uh, um, it's, it's very sad that people, some people cannot be comfortable in their own cities or that they feel that they are outcasts in their own uh, cities for so for me this is very important because that is where people live 
and 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 we are here for for we we make policies and legislation so so people can lead a better life so obviously how people are living their lives in the cities is is a, 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 an important concern for for me well with regards to reparative therapy that's a subject which is very 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 close to uh, my heart and and i hope that as as minister i i was able to to give a good example in 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 the sense that it was i i passed legislation in malta and and the reparative therapy is outlawed in in malta it's it's a crime so so i hope and and wherever i can i i speak about this and encourage um, other other countries to do so because i said yesterday and i was quoted in, in one of the in one of the portals that i said that that this is a joke because you cannot change a person a person is 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 born how he or she is born and no amount of therapy <laughs> reparative or not for me it's it's a, it's an oxymoron because you can't repair some, some how some somebody's nature how 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 they are born and i i stressed it in 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 the press conference i said this is biology this is science this is nature this is how we are so so this issue of of reparative therapy um really it really breaks my heart because because i've been in focus groups and and in meetings with with people who have gone through it and it's horrible nobody would want it on on his enemies let alone on on people you might you may love or 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 somebody who is your son or your brother or your sister you know so so uh, really it's 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 terrible it's it's a really terrible practice and i feel very very strongly about it very strongly so i will continue to fight uh, as hard as i can even because it is very dangerous as well and but i don't have the the competence to outlaw reparative therapy uh, in other member states so uh, i but i will con i will continue working and and giving visibility to this reality because many people don't know that it's happening that's another thing i when i spoke with with people who went through reparative therapy i got the same uh, the same reaction i had the same reaction as when i attended a non publicized uh, conference by and of by intersex people and and it's 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 terrible to even think that there are people who are living lives through no fault of their own but it's because society makes them feel that way and and acts and discriminates against them and at at when they are born they are operated upon to be made either a girl or a boy because they have to register the child and that is one one legislation i passed as well in 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 malta when i got to know of this reality that you don't have to register your your child as a girl or a boy uh, the minute that they that they are born but let them develop and see because because what what i saw when i spoke to uh, these intersex people was that many many surgeries went the wrong way and and it's 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 incredible the 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 suffering which these people go through so i will continue speaking about these things because what i'm saying now is happening there's there's uh, intersex um surgery going on as we speak there's reparative therapy going on as as we as we speak and this must stop but we must give it give these issues visibility um yes Katrina, yes, the council, yes, has a lot of 
support. Uh, as, you, as you may recall, 18 member states had supported the call for a strategy because you know I have a bit of a history in, 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 in this in this strategy. In 2013, together with the Dutch government, I had pressed uh, for, for the commission uh, to have an LGBTIQ strategy. And in response to that, at the time, they had come out with an LGBTIQ list of actions. Okay, so that was not enough for me. Then in, 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 in 20, it, it was a good start, but we, we had to um, commit more. And in 2018, together with uh, 18 member states, uh, I, I wrote to the commission and, and I had this call for a strategy, little did I know that I will have to write the strategy myself because I, I would be commissioner for equality, but that's how it happened. So I made the, the call for the strategy in, in 2018 and now I, I am delivering on it. So uh, it's a good starting point. And also with regards to your point, Katrin, on, uh, on other commissioners and, and how uh, we are working so that we, we can really uh, have the uh, is the subject of equality mainstreamed. Uh, as you know, we have the task force, which is doing very good work. Uh, apart from speaking personally to the commissioners, we have these people who are in every portfolio. So from the beginning, at the outset of any policy or legislation, which the um, commission will be presenting. Uh, there's this expert on equality, mainstreaming equality, giving the equality perspective into whatever it is that the commission uh, is doing. But I must say also that I have a lot of support from the uh, commissioners, especially when they hear these real life stories about the suffering of people through no fault of their own. Uh, and I say, how can we discriminate against people because of the way they were born? And, and I applied this when we came to the anti-racism strategy, when we came to the Roma strategy, and, and there's this humanity, which, which uh, a college uh, really, really understand that what we are doing is, is necessary if we really want to arrive at having a union of uh, equality. And, and even if there is a small percentage, like when, for instance, we speak about uh, intersex people, I, I say to me, even if there is one person who we can do something about to relieve their pain and, 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 and their, uh, to alleviate their pain and their suffering, then we must work for that. But obviously we are not speaking of, of a small percentage when we speak of the whole LGBTIQ uh, spectrum, as, as we all know. Um, so really we must pull up our socks and work seriously <laughs> in this area of policy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. There is still, would you allow us one more minute for one question by uh, Adela Horakova? who is campaigning for equal marriage in uh, the Czech Republic. Do you have a few more minutes? Yes, uh, Adela. Great, thank you very much. Um, good morning, Madam Commissioner. I'm very happy to be here with you. As Sophie said, I am the lawyer for the Czech marriage equality campaign. Um, my question relates to something that someone said earlier uh, during this call today, that there are funds, European funds being used for activities in some member states which are actually undermining what we're talking about here today. Uh, so my question is, is there a system of cross-checking uh, whether um, EU is not actually funding um, activities that are contradictory to what's in our LGBTIQ strategy? Well, I, I, I know that there is a very rigorous uh, system of, of, you know, checking, checking uh, these, these um, uh, pro pro programs, application for, for projects. Um, and as you know, uh, we, we did stop um, funds for, for um, um, projects which were for, for, 
for um, uh, countries which were using their projects in, in, in LGBTIQ free um, zones. And uh, but if you know of of instances where maybe something was overlooked, and and now I will be um, it would be my job actually to flag it and and and. Uh, Pass on. As as far as I know, they are very rigorous and, and very vigilant. Uh, in fact, in fact, um, we, we took action on on where we saw that things are not um, right. But but please feel free to to contact me or my staff if, if, if uh, it's the, you know of, of concrete cases where this is happening. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I, I see one more question, but I'm afraid that we have really come to uh, the end of the session. Um, so I would again like to thank the Commissioner very much for uh, agreeing to be with us. Um, you will have wholehearted support for your proposals uh, from the Renew Group, but also all the other partners uh, here present. Uh, I think uh, we will also um, uh, make some further proposals for legislative instruments for your toolkit. Uh, because I, I do think uh, that, you know, we can legislate on a couple of issues. I mean, about, for example, criminalizing uh, conversion therapy. Uh, I mean, we're criminalizing lots of things in the European Union, you know, uh, environmental dumping or uh, uh, terrorist traveling somewhere. I'm sure that we can. I mean, this is violence against children. I'm sure we can we can criminalize it. But we will also, I think, um, be uh, pushing the Commission, uh, and in that sense will be your ally, uh, when it comes to enforcement of existing instruments, laws and case laws, uh, case law. Um, and finally, the point we made at the start, uh, we will be uh, pushing the Commission also very hard to fight harder for uh, an independent judiciary in all the countries, because we, we see in Poland and Hungary how much damage it can do. But yesterday, we've also seen in Lithuania uh, how a, an independent judiciary can actually be uh, a tool for uh, safeguarding equality and, and rights. So we'll be your, uh, your army of allies uh, in, in the coming years uh, and um, where you need support um, uh, in the Commission or in the Council uh, will be behind you. Thank you very much again. I would also like to thank uh, all the speakers, all the, the colleagues who were present here who made this event very successful. Uh, I consider this the, the start of uh, uh, another four years of hard work. Uh, and at the end of the four years, uh, I am sure that we will have achieved a lot of tangible, concrete progress. Thank you all very much and have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>